because we are not thirsty. We merely want recognition of those rights that are ours. There is no single voice for the American Negro today. Some of us are disillusioned, some of us are frustrated, many are angry. We're difficult to know, harder to understand. I know because I'm a Negro. The only way the white man can know me is to walk in my shoes. Alan Howell Close Up, a penetrating look at today, brought to you by the expanding worlds of Alan Howell. In photography, capturing the things we can see. In electronics, through its CEC division, recording the mysterious things we cannot see. Alan Howell for Home and Industry. Finer products through imagination. It's like hell to live up here. Well, the condition, the housing conditions here is something terrible. The rats, the mice, the roaches. It isn't very pleasant, I can tell you that. The people wants to have something to hold on to, but they have nothing. The salaries are small, the rents are big, and the people just can't get along on the thing. That's why you find the people walking the streets trying to do things that they're not illegal and otherwise. We appreciate nice things, you know. We, we really like to have nice things, but we can't afford them. None of what love we have. We stay in hock from day to day. <laughs> Just as soon as you get through paying one bill, you owe another. So how are, how are you how are you going to exist? You, you, you are a perpetual hawk shop. Water runs down and leaks all over everywhere. From uh, it comes from the leak and the plastic fell down. All those holes, the big rats. And it comes in, up and down that hole on the floor. The bath stool is about falling in the basin. Mm -hmm. I have um, one bedroom in, up there in the front and the kitchen. I pay $64 a month. Why don't you move out? Well, I can't get nowhere to go. Why can't you get anywhere to go? The rent and thing is so high. When you go to a, a office like that, you had to pay about two, three hundred dollars before you get a, a partner. I worked, worked on the farm in North Carolina. Me and my husband, my husband was living. Do you think you are better off now than you are in North Carolina? Yeah. I don't like that, man. I get long better up here. You never, you, you never can give a man anything that you, uh, when you took away everything. Anything you give him is just a morsel in comparison to what he deserves. 
When you take a man and you take his language, you take his home, you take his wife, you take his children. <laughs> well, my God, what do you want from them? Some of the people who might have an opportunity to move have been so beaten, so destroyed by the constant pounding of prejudice, segregation, discrimination, and bigotry, that they no longer have the will to walk through a door which may be open to them. Crowded, the Negro ghetto dweller feels inferior to whites who live no better than he does. He still has that disability, that social disability, the color of his skin, which tells him that no matter what he may be, he is still somehow not equal to the other man. Going downtown to meet the man, the white man you work for. Throughout America, three out of four Negroes now live in cities. More than one million Negroes are crowded together in New York City alone. A hundred blocks or so, and you're in the brighter world of the whites. Here it's New York City's garment district, but it might be any industry in any city. It's always the same. The Negroes are concentrated in the worst jobs, the lowest levels, 
On the average, we're paid only $6 for every 10 a white man makes. And while we're catching up, at the present rate, we won't pull even for another 40 years. We're stuck down here. How many of us make it up there? And what if you do make it up and out to the suburbs? What if you even make it big? I feel that no matter where you go, politically, or economically, or ethnically, whatever you may go, you're going to find that you are still hamstrung with this identification of being a Negro. Even here in Mount Vernon. Even, even anywhere, anywhere. Even, even in Canada, even you're in... still a Negro even in, even in Paris. <laughs> Wherever you may go, you are going to find that you are ethnically still tied to being a Negro and that it does make a difference. And I'm not at all sure that I want to be anything else. Some years ago, I was in Omaha, Nebraska, and I had uh, to speak to a group of young Jewish persons connected with a synagogue in Omaha. Well, the rabbi said, you must remember, we are five o'clock Jews. In other words, these persons are just another American citizen woven into the fabric of the community. But at five o'clock, we become Jews. The only difference here, of course, is that a Negro is a 24-hour Negro. I think this. Last night, uh, I had a very interesting experience. I went in the room uh, down at the Waldorf Hotel of a visiting group here from an African country. And I spoke, visited these three different Africans. Uh, one, of the, one of the men who was a chief and who was very wealthy asked me, why do we put up, why do you American Negroes put up with all of this in the South? And uh, uh, I answered him, I said, perhaps for the same reason that we asked ourselves for long, why, for so long, why uh, you Africans put up with the British, the French, the Italians running your country for you. And he had not seen the relationship there. Uh, but then he saw it clear. And I indicated to him that I felt that this was a century in which we would find uh, a resurgence of the black man and of the darker people because the history of, of the world shows that every civilization has at one time been the kingpin. I mean, the Portuguese at one time ran the world, the Spanish at one time ran it, the Italians, the British, the French, all of them have had that day. And Africa had its day way early, uh, much earlier. So I think we're coming back a full cycle. And I think the influence of Africa and of the American Negro in the United States upon its conscience is going to be felt with its full impact within the next 20 years. I think, that, I think the time has come when the white man's time is running out on him, just like the tide. He's got to go. His time is here. And there's no two ways about it. Well, if his own mathematics is correct, the cycle of time will absorb him, just like it did the Egyptian Empire, the Roman Empire, the German Empire, the Spanish Empire. Now, it has come in one piece. And I think that if we do have this resurgence, that it will be incumbent upon us to uh, use it more wisely out of the depth of our experiences with segregation and with discrimination so that the human race can be brought together irrespective of color. And I don't think that this is going to give the black man any license the whole white man's empire is about to crumble. I hope that he can cope with it as well as we did when we had to cope with, with his taking over. I hope that he will be able to cope 
and be as humble and understanding as we were. We'll return to Walk in My Shoes after this message from Bell and Howell. We're finding a new way to express our problem, and the whites are laughing with us. You know, I feel so sorry for Willie. I hate to see any baseball player having troubles, because that's a great sport for my people. That is the only sport in the world where a Negro can shake a stick at a white man and won't start no ride. <laughs> Of course, now, don't get me wrong now. We're doing all right. Well, at the rate we're going 10 years from now, you might have to be my color to get a job. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, they're not making man tan for nothing. <laughs> and you heard what Bobby Kennedy said about eight weeks ago. He said, 30 years from this year, Negro can become president. So treat me right, or I'll get in there and raise taxes on you. <laughs> I mean, now don't get me wrong, I wouldn't mind paying my income tax if I knew it was going to a friendly country. <laughs> and we have a lot of racial prejudice up north, but we're so clever with it. Take my hometown, Chicago. I mean, you can't see it just, just going in there. When the Negroes in Chicago move into one large area and it looked like we might control the votes, they don't say anything to us. They have a slum clearance. <laughs> you do the same thing on the West Coast, but you call it freeways. <laughs> well, anybody here from Chicago? Where do you live in Chicago? South side, whereabouts? North side? Lawrence, yeah. How long you been away? Seven years. You're in a hell of a surprise if you ever go back. My brother just moved in there. That's it. Dick, with this new Negro humor, what is the white man laughing about? I think the white man is laughing at the same thing a person laughs at when they slam their hand in the car door and when it's about to heal. The problem is almost over. As Martin Luther King said, Jim Crow is dead in the South. It's just a matter of how expensive they want to make the funeral. You can always laugh at problems that's right. Everyone in the whole world knows this is a wrong. So then you can make humor out of this and matter of fact, you enlightening people on just what's going on. No one actually knows the Negro problem. The average white man meets a Negro at work when we're in an inferiority position. Uh, you hear a lot of Southerners say, well, the Negroes that I've been around, they say they want uh, segregation. They don't want to move into our schools. Well, this is what I call taking the fifth. If Jimmy Hoffa and all the big hooligans can take the fifth, then uh, uh, how come we can't take the fifth? We don't need to take the first when we can't get the 14th. And this is just a matter of fact. It's the same bit in the South and up north, you know. Uh, the color fellow working with me is one of the most intelligent fellows I've ever met. Well, who is he talking about? The janitor, the maid, he give him any tips on stock, he know what's going on in world problems. This has been a bit where we say he's intelligent to make up for not letting him go to school. And this is the way we've been doing this. Some of my best friends are colored. Well, this is not true. They don't take their best friend anywhere. They don't take them out on Saturday night. They still enter through the back door, so how could this be a best friend? And a lot of them, they don't even know the best friend's last name, just the first name that they've been calling them by for 40 years. They don't know nothing about his family, nothing about his problems. Our problems don't always show, but even here in a Chicago neighborhood where Negroes equal whites economically, you'll find we're more disillusioned about the idea of white superiority than we were before we made it. Now, I used to differ with your use of the word unfortunate. Brown, I thought we had progressed way beyond the, the term of unfortunate. But we have not. Brown. Dolores, we have not. But the unfortunate is thing is that <laughs> while we are 100 years beyond the Civil War, the basic frame of reference, the basic value system of American culture says positively, unequivocally, if you're black, get back. If you're white, you're right. If you're brown, stick around. <laughs> may, may I interrupt you? 
Yes. I am neither black nor white. Where do I go? Well, you are what we would call, <laughs> what we would call in the French, I guess, and that perhaps this is the reason why French is the language of the plumbers here. You are neither come see nor come saw. <laughs> you are Kelka Shores in the middle. <laughs> uh, this is where the white man is wrong about this integration thing. He seems to be of the opinion that we want to intermarry, that we want to socialize, such as we're doing here now. This matter of friendship, I think, uh, uh, runs its own course. I think people seek their friends and make their friends in a natural course of association, be they black, white, green, yellow, or brown. But let me get back to what you originally said. They think we want to socialize with them. They think we want to sit with them. They think we want to go to school with their children. These are the things that they think. Well, we do. But we do want to go to school with them, of course. Well, the but the important thing is we don't want to be denied. But the biggest thing is what they fear. They but fear we don't want to go. This is not well, our point. It's not argument, that we don't, want, we don't necessarily want to go to school with Hold them. Hold it, Mary. This whole argument, you know, this, this business infuriates me. The attempt to explain my highest motivation to achieve the objectives of my life in terms of the bedroom or communism, this I've got to go down on. I'm not going to stand still for this. Well, it's certainly that the, it's certain that the bedroom argument is always the argument that the, uh, the extremists, the lunatic friends, we might say, always use that to try to end all discussion. Well, isn't this ridiculous? It's too late for the bedroom argument. Long I, I frankly think, Dolores, that your, your complexion <laughs> is enough to end that argument right now. <laughs> the bedroom argument began back in slavery days, well, and it didn't slavery. start with the Negroes. Well, this should be because I know of no Negro slave who had the courage to go into any white plantation owner's house and look after his wife. Exactly, Uninvited. exactly. But many were invited. But, but, so we see which direction the motivation moves in. Yes. Well, anyway, I think that the whole argument, uh, the, the, the objection to the Southern, especially the Southern white man, is the matter of intermarriage and socializing and so forth. And the day that he looks up and looks around to Negroes like us, he will find out that it's way too late, that he better get down off of that kind of an argument and find some other reason for objecting to us. Exactly, we're not, Delores. We're not all black. We're, some of us are white, some of us are brown, some of us are the same color. This whole business of integration, I think we've looked at it in one way, integration for the Negro. But I think that integration in America will free the white man. Integration will make the white man respect the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. It will make him respect the Bill of Rights. It will make him become a, an American finally, following his own constitution, which he has never followed properly because Negroes would not be living in ghettos. We wouldn't have this, this separation by color. Los Angeles offers a good life. Out here, life looks very good. <laughs> well, I've got one more week of vacation left. I think I'm going to do as much of this outside living as I can before I get locked up in that dental office again. These hamburgers look good and charred. How about well, that? Well, I don't need one right I now. No, thanks, Senator Williams. Okay. <laughs> How much time do you have left on your vacation, Al? I have two more weeks left. Two more weeks? You've been keeping in the condition while you've been away? Oh, yes. I've been playing a lot of tennis. Well, good. Good. Life looks good, but we, too, are being pushed by our own people. Negroes with little education, with very little skill, are moving to Los Angeles from the south at the rate of 1,600 every month but they're not finding the promised land. They bring problems with them. Finding jobs for themselves is one, and they create new problems for those who came before. If you recall, at our last meeting, we discussed the problem of integrated housing, and we found out that almost 1,700 Negroes are moving into Los Angeles a month. By 1970, there'll probably be a million Negroes in this city. And I know that people are concerned about this. They may not talk about it very often, but I certainly heard them shudder in church when he said there would be a million Negroes in Los Angeles. We shudder because we were saying, in essence, the majority of these people are not like we are. And uh, we felt that we, maybe some of us felt we left this out because we were getting away from this problem. We are a part of this exodus, too. But we are a little maybe embarrassed by the fact that here we're going to have a, a mass element come in that, that's going to create a tremendous social problem in the community. 
to which we find a uh, great deal of difficulty in relating to. Well, I don't want to sound like a do-gooder, <laughs> because I really am not, and I'm somewhat of a snob. But I do think that with these people coming in who are not our intellectual equals, nor are they of our so sociological uh, bracket, uh, they're not to be a handicap to us. They'll find their own level. Now, I do sound like a snob, but I don't mean it this way. But they're used to living a certain way, and they too might uh, rise, up, uh, rise up above their origin and might one day be our associates. The whole tone of this meeting is the second profession of being a Negro. And we are out here a while, and we're working in our own field, and then we find out that here are these same problems are following on the heels of 1,600 Negroes a month that come into Los Angeles. Now, this gives us problems. It's our own view. It's our own identifying with these Negroes that are coming in with their carpet bags that causes us problems. This is our basic embarrassment that we as Negroes have. We want to live together, yet we want to sort of scatter to the far winds and live amongst uh, white people. We, we, we are brought up in terms of this, that to have a dark skin, to, have, to be a Negro, there is something wrong with it. And if you take a child and raise him, uh, a, a child, a very impressionable child, and have him grow up in an atmosphere where your color of skin is something that is looked down upon, that there is something wrong with you, that you are... are, are uh, are not, you, you don't have the abilities of other people. Even no matter how much education, no matter how much uh, training, et cetera, you have, a lot of these impressions stay with you. I feel that we have to search for a new image. When I wake up in the morning, I don't look in the mirror and say, you are a Negro, therefore you will face life in a certain way. I see myself as a person, just like all the people that I work with and the children that I deal with. And they're all people. I've got to break in here. Yeah. This, I, I, I tolerate this in long. This idea of this consciousness of you've got to look in the mirror to face yourself to, to go through this bit about being a Negro is very naive. You the uh, uh, individual, you this concept was instilled in you before you could think. Right. Oh, I don't agree you with see. you. And first of all, we have, as a symbol in our community, the white, straight hair, brown hair, as the symbol of the thing to strive for. Now, there's nothing wrong with it, except that it represents the very fact that we are talking about. And this cement wall between what we are aware of and what we think we think. Now, wait, let me finish this, please. Uh, the, the idea, the Negro in our society is a rejected child. There's no two ways about it. It, it's in Los Angeles, it's in New York City, it's in any place in the United States. We'll continue with Walk in My Shoes after this message from Bell and Howell. 1954. We'll never forget the day the Supreme Court ruled white schools must admit us. It was a legal victory for the NAACP. We agreed with Adam Powell. This is democracy's finest hour. This is communism's worst defeat. The news of this decision is the news of world significance. Southern people will not stand for this monstrous proposition. Southern people believe in segregated schools. Both races believe in segregated schools. A court decree is no better than the public sentiment which supports it. These jeering demonstrators of earlier years have now, in many cities, been kept away by the force of an aroused public opinion. But to many of us, even the 1961 progress, 18 students in Dallas, 9 in Atlanta, is only token integration. It's new proof to many of us that legal weapons aren't enough, that white law doesn't mean what it says after all. In seven long years since 1954, on deceptively tranquil Southern Negro campuses, our new generation was growing up, well-trained, fully qualified, no longer willing to go slow as our parents were. We gave Negro impatience a voice. 
We turned our backs on legalism. It was too slow. We prefer to use with new energy the classic tools of more active, nonviolent writing and sitting in for freedom, for first class citizenship. We made sure our voice was heard. We merely want respect and dignity. That is the thing that the Negroes are, Negro youth in the South are revolting against. And we are revolting against that adult Negro who is continually selling out the Negro. We feel, uh, of course, uh, there's, the young people are energetic and ambitious to do things, but uh, we feel you need a certain amount of maturity and, uh, and to, to whip that uh, young leadership. And uh, we think the, the, the present leadership has done a lot to advance us to the point where we are now. He says he represents the Negro. He does not represent anybody but himself. He is looking for security. That's what our elders are looking for. But we do not want security. I firmly believe we can best achieve objectives that we are seeking, and we agree with the objectives the students are seeking through sincere, forthright uh, negotiation and, and around the conference table. We have utterly pushed aside the old stymated adult Negro leadership in the South, and we have organized ourselves into student groups, into student protests, nonviolent protest groups, and we have seen real change in the South within the last past year and a half. Many of the students work with Dr. Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Wyatt T. Walker is director. To Dr. King's chief assistant, the new mood is not a question of age alone. Ten years ago, people would say, well, the, the NAACP is the worst organization in America. It's subversive. Uh, then when the sit-downs came, uh, they said to us, well, no, you shouldn't sit in. We ought to do it the way the sane and stable NAACP does it. Now, this year, we're hearing that, well, the Freedom Ride is not the the way to do it. You ought to do it the way you did the sit-ins. And I've predicted in the next several months when another area is attacked, they'll say, well, you should have done that like you did the Freedom Rise. And so the defense has just moved back one line each time. Some people have conjectured that maybe there's a split in Negro leadership now. And I don't think it's that so much as it is there's a basic difference in people. There's a difference between people who will act and people who won't act on what they believe. And it is just now that uh, the generation that grew up during the war years has come of age now. They're college-bred youngsters. They're urbane to a degree. They know what they want. And they are insistent that they be American citizens right now. And they are be being joined by hundreds and thousands across the South, both young and old. In New York, another headquarters for Freedom Riders is the Congress on Racial Equality, CORE for short. It's headed by Jim Farmer, who paints much the same picture of a swelling wave of confidence. I think there is a new element in the civil rights struggle today as compared with uh, years ago. Uh, in the past, the Negroes uh, wanted to fight against segregation, but they tried to do it with a minimum of risk and a minimum of suffering. They asked other people to eliminate segregation for them. But now the younger Negro is willing to risk all sorts of things, even jail, even suffering, even pain, even death. I think their courage has been a contagious thing. Many of their parents and the older people in the community are catching it, too. Uh, they are saying, if my kids can risk all of this, then why not I? Uh, their, their consciences are being disturbed. I went out of a guilty conscience. I live in New York now. I lived in Texas as a child. Although I live in New York, I'm reminded, as every other Negro must be in New York, that we're not free. I'm also reminded that as long as a door is closed to a men's waiting room that is Mark Cullet in Jackson, Mississippi, I'm not free to go into Grand Central Station in New York City. I was to have tried to get onto the first Freedom bus that went south. People were injured on that bus. People were beaten in Alabama. This set up a guilt complex in me because Percy Sutton hadn't gone. Percy Sutton had stayed in New York. He excused himself by saying that 
He had work to do in the NAACP. He had cases in court. But deep down within Percy Sutton, he felt that he was afraid. And to live with Percy Sutton, I had to go. But I'll tell you the most cruel thing that I experienced was not being in jail in Jackson, Mississippi, as they tried to brainwash me, as they do all who go to Jackson, Mississippi. But it was a ride from Atlanta, Georgia, to Montgomery, Alabama. And it was a feeling of building fear as I rode in the front of the bus, just two of us, through hostile territory. A territory that I had been through before and which I have always ridden in the back of the bus because I didn't have guts to get in the front of the bus. But now the time had come. I was riding in the front of the bus. I don't remember how many hours it was from Atlanta, but if it was six hours, actually by trip, it was 60 hours of the fear of the mind. So much so, had this tension built up, that as we went through the countryside and we looked out and I saw the red clay, we passed Tuskegee Institute where I had gone to school and the segregated circumstances where I had been in the for Air Force as a Negro cadet, where I had graduated as a Negro officer who could not eat in the white officers club as I prepared to go and fight the American cause. I looked at Tuskegee, I was so doggone scared, not afraid, scared, that I wanted to get off the bus, get out, and stay at Tuskegee. Tuskegee was a familiar name. Montgomery was a place of hostility. Montgomery, I remembered from 1940. I remembered Montgomery from the capital. It's the capital of Alabama. On the capital step, a shoeshine boy, not more than 18. Head split open from behind and blood streaming, somehow gushing over the front of his face and down. This was 1940, but that has always symbolized Montgomery, Alabama to me. Finally, we arrived in Montgomery. We were going into Montgomery, as we later found out, in the face of a court order, a federal court order that said no one would go in as a freedom rider. This was Montgomery. This was the hostile Montgomery in which the beatings had just taken place a few days prior to this of the freedom riders. We pulled into the bus station of Montgomery, Alabama, and now the moment of truth had arrived. The bus pulled into the station. I got ready to get up and started to stand and my legs wouldn't hold me. This is fear. Now fear from what? Fear from riding into the bus station? No, fear compounded from Percy Sutton who couldn't go to the white playground as a kid. Percy Sutton who was put off a train as an officer, a captain in Texarkana in 1945 when he had returned from fighting a war for his country. These were the fears that come up over the years. And what have they done to Percy Sutton? They distilled his legs as effectively as if a nerve had been sat upon. And they were cold. And I had to massage my legs to get up, to get off the bus. And this was fear. Fear that no one else would experience except the Negro. Fear from conditioning. And it's a cruel sort. We got off the bus, we went into the bus station. And it isn't more than 50 to 100 steps between the bus and the lunch counter, the white lunch counter there. And I went then into the lunch counter, through the body of people into the white lunch counter, and we sat there, Mark Lane and Percy Sutton, white Mark Lane, Percy Sutton, Negro, sat at the lunch counter together. And there were a number of people sitting there. and we called to the lady for service. And the thing we decided to ask for was orange juice, because the orange juice was right there. And Mark Lane, sitting with me, frightened to death himself, said, Madam, I'd like to have some 
orange juice. And he screamed out orange juice and blurted it forth from him. And the lady looked at him with scorn and she says, I'll serve you when I get through. Now, of course, those are harsh words, but they were pretty words to us because we knew that we were going to be served at least. Then a few moments later, after indeed she was through serving everyone else, she came over to the counter and took two glasses of orange juice, slid them down the counter to us, and I tell you, that was the nicest warm orange juice I'd ever tasted because it marked the end of a trip. We'll return to Walk In My Shoes after this message from Bell and Howell. May I take it that the assembly decides by acclamation to receive the Federation of Nigeria as a member of the United Nations. I think the emerging of new nations in Africa has had a great deal of effect upon the attitude of Negroes in this country. Uh, they have seen uh, black people um, across the seas who are asserting themselves and uh, developing into self-determination. Uh, this has given the uh, Negro American a new sense of self-respect, a new dignity, because he knows that he does have a tradition, he does have a background, and uh, he belongs. You want to belong to a people. Africa is a country. Africans are people. <laughs> I'm not a Russian. I'm not a Red. I'm not a Cuban. I'm not an American. I'm an African. That's right. <laughs> Somebody questioned me when I said that I'm not American. The white man won't allow me to be American. American is a man who is protected by the government, and he has all rights that any other man has. And damn it, you don't have those rights. And you're not an American citizen. There is no such thing as second-class citizen. You are a citizen or you are a slave. That's right. That's right. As president of the National Baptist Convention, the largest organization of Negroes in the world, I believe, it, I'm firmly convinced that we, the convention has to give its full and unqualified support to every creative attempt to resolve the problem of race and to actualize our democracy right now in America. I think it must be done now because I believe first on the side of the Negro community itself that within the next year or two at the very most unless very real and substantial progress has made toward the democratization of the American community the rug will have been pulled completely from under responsible Negro leadership so called and the leadership of the Negro masses, especially huddled in our great cities, will have passed to people who, whose preachments of violence and whose negative attitudes toward everything American will have very dire results. The largest, best organized preachers of black supremacy are Elijah Muhammad's black Muslims with 100,000 disciplined members who want their own state right here in America. They appeal to spectators from all over the world, including uniformed members of other black nationalist groups. Elijah Muhammad's men dress conventionally, but their women do not. Meetings begin with a Muslim prayer, here invoked by Malcolm X. In the name of Allah, the all-wise, true and living God, not a, a dead God, but a living God. You are gathered here this afternoon to hear the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's message, which you knew in advance was titled, Separation or Death.
The Honorable Elijah Muhammad has shown us how integration won't work. Since seven years have passed, since the Supreme Court issued the desegregation decision, we only have 6% compliance with that Supreme Court law up at, the, up, up at this moment. 6% in seven years. Less than 1% per year. And these Negro leaders still walking around here thinking the white man is going to bring about integration. <laughs> we who have had our eyes opened by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad call that token integration. And no one will accept token integration but a child, but children. Is that right or wrong? So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has taught us, since we see the government itself, with its army, with its navy, with its marines and air force, uh, backing up the National Guard, is still incapable of bringing about integration, we reject it. It takes too long, and you don't have that much time left. The press has misled the public. I would like to point out that it is this misrepresentation that has caused people to misunderstand Mr. Muhammad. They say that he deals with the emotions of our people. No. When you tell a man that he's Jim Crow, you're not playing on his emotions. You're telling him the truth. What you talking about? Holy. When you tell a black man that his neck is being broken on the tree, day in and day out, that he is segregated, Jim Crow, spit upon, deprived of civil rights, and deprived of equal rights, deprived of first-class citizenship. That's not playing on anybody's emotion. That's playing on a man's intelligence. <laughs> the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches black men to go with black women. He says that white women are for white men. And because some of these integration-minded Negroes right, right. who have been looking forward all of their life to a time when they could slip, slip into the white neighborhood right. and slip out with one of your women, when they hear what Mr. Muhammad is saying, they come and whisper in your ear and make you think Mr. Muhammad is teaching hate. <laughs> no, Mr. Muhammad is teaching black men to leave black women alone, or rather white women alone. He's teaching black men to leave white women alone. And after we wake up, we will see that you leave our black women alone. <laughs> and this is what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us, that we must have separation in order to be equal. We must have separation in order to have freedom. We must have separation in order to have justice. And to get all of this, we have to have some land to do it on. I believe that the num their numbers may, of actual dues-paying members may not be tremendously significant, but I think the movement is tremendously significant because I think far beyond the actual dues-paying numbers that dress themselves to an anger and a frustration deep in the Negro American community. And now, a final word from Bell and Howell. Like everything else, even the day comes to an end. The trouble is, tomorrow's going to be just like it was today. How long, how long? It seems so much longer when you don't seem to be getting anywhere. We want to be like everybody else, no different from the next guy. Is that too much? Because we won't settle for any less. That day's gone forever. Very 
very real and substantial progress has made toward the democratization of the American community, the rug will have been pulled completely from under responsible Negro leadership. And the leadership of the Negro masses will have passed to people whose preachments of violence will have very dire results. Nonviolence is when a white man hits you. But when they come to you, it is not so If they believe in turning the cheek, why don't they turn the cheek for a black fist? White man, boy, was reading the Bible. And the little boy said, Papa, the Bible said, love your neighbor. Do that mean uh, a nigger? I don't want to go out and replace white supremacy with black supremacy. I just want my fair share of what's out there. I don't know whether I'm looking for my day or just a part of the day that I'm entitled to. Whatever I have the ability and the education and the desire to accomplish, just don't hold me back. Let me go at my own pace. Now, where do I go and how do I get there? Do you know? What do you expect me to do? The American Broadcasting Company wishes to thank its sponsor, Bell & Howell, for encouraging our complete editorial freedom throughout this series.